I want to begin by just uh, reminding you uh, once again, I, I have already spoken about this and I've sent out an email to the class, but I just want to remind you that uh, the makeup class is not going to be held tomorrow and instead it's going to be held, uh, as mentioned previously, on uh, Saturday, February 9th um, at the Fowler at 12 o'clock. So we're going to spend about an hour at the Fowler Museum uh, looking at this exhibition that I've mentioned to you before on Swahili arts across the Indian Oceans. Uh, and then we're going to spend an hour uh, outside the Fowler, uh, not in a classroom, but you know somewhere in the quad, maybe under a tree or something. I'll think of a place which would be appropriate, uh, partly because, as I've mentioned to you, uh, this uh, uh, notion of uh, holding classes in what is called a classroom uh, is not always been the way in which education has been conducted. Uh, this, in fact, is itself a characteristic feature of the modern age. Um, and we have to understand that there are different sites of learning. Um, and I want to sh share with you, just on this note, a very moving uh, image. Um, because, I mean, of course you all know that the United States was a deeply segregated society. Um, and that in the South, for example, there were no such thing as shared classrooms. Um, and that was, in fact, actually a tremendous struggle to try to achieve an integrated classroom. Uh, because the kind of mix that we have in the classroom at the moment, for example, is something that would have been inconceivable. Um, and even uh, when accommodations began to be made, uh, there were a lot of uh, questions about how it was going to be done. So the image I want to share with you is this one here, which is really quite an extraordinary image. It's of a man called uh, McLaurin. You see him in the far right over there. Um, and you can see that, so this is, this is an attempt to, he was, he was admitted to the University of Oklahoma, uh, 1948, uh, but he could not sit in the classroom along with the others. Uh, this is, of course, before the case, the famous case called Brown versus Board of Education, which is 1954, uh, when the Supreme Court ruled that facilities, including educational facilities, could no longer be segregated. Uh, he's also a much older man than all the other students that you see. So you see these students, uh, all of course white, uh, seated there in their crisp, you know, uh, jackets or shirts and ties. And then you see this man who's sitting really on the side. So he has to listen in from a distance uh, to what is uh, happening in the classroom. Um, so I, I, I hope you understand why, why I'm insistent on this idea that we really should think about the spaces of modernity as well. Uh, which include such things as the classroom, the very idea of the university, uh, and of course the museum, uh, which is one reason why I've planned a makeup class uh, at the museum. All right, so let's go back to, so this is the agenda that we have for today. Um, and I want to begin with some concluding thoughts about Japan. I'd already spoken to you in the finishing moments of my previous lecture about what was transpiring in Japan. Um, so recall that I'd spoken to you about the Meiji Restoration, uh, and what the Meiji Restoration really means. Uh, the word Meiji, re Meiji Restoration refers to the Enlightenment age, as it were, that a new system of politics was introduced into Japan. Uh, there's a parliamentary system uh, with two houses, as was the case in Britain. Um, uh, and of course, uh, the United States is not uh, referred to as a parliamentary democracy. It's a different kind of democracy, but again, we do have two houses, of course, in the, in the US too, the, the House of Representatives and or two legislative assemblies, if you want to put it this way, and the Senate. Of course, the, the fundamental difference between, between the US and the Britain being, among other things, uh, that, uh, that in, in, in Britain, the House of Lords does not even remotely have the kind of powers that the House of Commons has. Uh, in fact, you, get, you don't get elected to the House of Lords, you really get nominated to the House of Lords, and that's what makes the House of Lords very different. Uh, from the US Senate. Um, but in any case, so they introduced these two bodies in Japan as well, uh, and uh, an elected house uh, as early as uh, 1884, although in Japan at that point in time, the electorate was only 5% uh, of the population. Uh, and, and as was the case in many countries such as the US, uh, initially the, the electorate is confined to, to men and men of property. Uh, fundamentally, right? But what you're going to have then is the advent of a new bureaucracy. The bureaucracy really grows considerably. Uh, by the early 1900s, we're talking about over 70,000 people who were employed 
by the central government in Japan. Uh, and you have a, re a regime of modernization, which all, of course also means, among other things, growing consumption uh, and the factory mode of production and so on. And by the, by the late uh, 1800s, Japan has a very modern army. Uh, when we're going to find out sh uh, later on, not, not in today's lecture, but there is a war in 1905 uh, between Japan and Russia, which Japan wins. And this is an extraordinary moment in the history of Asia, not just in the history of Japan, um, as we're going to find out. There is also a cult of the emperor. Uh, this is going to become a fundamental issue uh, because, uh, as some of you may be aware, and again, this is something we turn to later on, but, but the beginnings of this are at this time, which is that at the end of World War II, uh, you know, the, the, that before the end of World War II could be declared, particularly in the Pacific front, because of course in Europe, uh, the end had come a little bit earlier with the defeat of Germany. Uh, but one of the things that the Americans insisted upon was the unconditional surrender of the Japanese. Uh, and the question had to do with the fate of the emperor, what was going to happen to the emperor. Would the emperor system be retained or not, right? So there, there are a long series of discussions that take place over that, but this idea of the cult of the emperor uh, and the place of the emperor in Japanese life goes back, uh, again, a very long period of time, but it becomes revived, I'm suggesting to you, in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, and I want to conclude this portion by simply reminding you of what I had mentioned in my previous class when I pointed out that Nehru makes this extraordinary observation, uh, which I think is something that you need to really ruminate about, reflect about, which is that Japan had actually adopted the spirit of Western civilization um, more so than the, uh, China had adopted the spirit uh, of Western civilization more so than Japan, but Japan adopted the outer okay, paraphernalia, so a modern technology and all of that, but that it really remained in some ways feudal in spirit. And the cult of the emperor, according to this mode of thinking, would be an instance of the fact that Japan, even though it modernized by having a modern system of politics, politics modern system of education and all of that, in some ways it still remained feudal in its outlook. Uh, and the word feudal has its difficulties, but I'm using it for the sake of convenience at the moment. So that we can translate that comment into the following question, which is, what does it mean to be modern? Right? That was the question that really came up. And by the way, this came up in uh, the United States in all kinds of ways in the 19th century. You know, for example, when women started wearing trousers, and going out in public in the late 1800s for the first time, there was an enormous discussion, enormous discussion in the public sphere. Right? And, so, and, so there were, and, and much of this had to do with the idea of the modern woman. Right? What, the, what does it really mean to be modern? So if she starts wearing trousers rather than skirts, if she starts smoking in public, well, does she become modern? Right? And so this is what I mean. That the real question here has to do with how we understand the idea of modern. You know, you can use technology. I mean, you've got billions of people living in villages in India who are using technology, modern technology. They're on Instagram. I mean, they, they, they have a much better command over that than I do. Uh, you know, they have Facebook accounts. They use Twitter, some of them. Right? I mean, there's this woman in India. Uh, she, she, she has this account uh, where she basically uh, Instagram, she has 20 million followers, and what does she do? She has basically got some recipes for home-cooked dal. Dal is, you know, a uh, form of lentil, okay? Um, and some recipes of that kind, and she's got 20 million, res 20 million followers, right? So this is what I mean. Now, but is she, is she, so does that make her modern, right? Because of course, then we'd have to ask, what does she understand about the question of rights? What does she understand about the notion of subjectivity? Right? What is her understanding of how time and space have collapsed? Instinctively, she may be acting that out already, which is what she's doing. But does she understand analytically, conceptually? Right? Her, do her values become modern? And that is a question that has never been fully resolved. 
I mean, there have been, there have been great writers who have argued that, well, we've never really become modern anyhow. Uh, right? So th that is something that goes back to these debates. All right, now, um, what I want to look at today is the question of migration, movement. All right, labor migration, refugees, immigrants. Uh, I don't have to tell you that all of this is as contemporary as it gets. And we have a person sitting in something called the White House who wants to put up a wall because apparently there is a deluge of refugees and immigrants who are going to come and destroy this country, right? And he wants to put up a wall. So this question of immigrants, refugees, exiles, is very much in the air. There are seven million Syrians who are no longer living in Syria. And I want you to remember this. You can check it out, don't take my word for it. How many, how many Syrians have been accepted in the United States out of those seven million refugees, you think? You know, two million, a million, half a million, well, the answer is less than 15,000. Less than 15,000. And Jordan and Lebanon together have over two and a half million Syrians. Okay? And I can tell you that today Syria might be represented in the press as a country that does only one thing. It sends out people, hordes. But there are very few countries in the world which have such an extraordinary history of offering hospitality to refugees as Syria does. If I had the time, I would give you an hour-long lecture just on that. Syria has been accepting refugees for a very long period of time, for 200 years. You, if you look at its record within what is called the Ottoman Empire, okay? And even in... 20 years ago, when the Iraq war took place, there were over a million Iraqis who were settled in Syria. So this is, I want you to step back now for a moment before we launch into this section, because we need to sort of think about where we are, right? We're, we're in the mid-19th century, sec mid-19th century, second half of the 19th century. And thus far, what have we looked at? What we've looked at is we've looked at revolutions, right, in the, both in the narrow and the expansive sense of the term. We've looked at political revolutions, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and we've looked at the idea of the nation and the nation state, because those were some of the things that emerged. Then, of course, one of the other things that emerged from that was the idea of the aspirations of human beings for freedom. And, and in that vein, we saw that the Haitian Revolution really occupies a space unto itself. It is really quite distinct in the annals of world history in many ways, right? But then we've also considered the whole idea of the Industrial Revolution and what does it mean to think about technology, the advance in technology, right? And in, and in relationship to Ship to that, two further themes. One is obviously the theme of capitalism right, and the new modes of production that came about and what were some of the consequences and some of the difficulties of that. And then, of course, the whole question of colonialism. Right? Now, one of the things that really, in a sense, links all of that, if you had to think of it this way, is this idea of movement. I don't want you to think just of immigrants and refugees and exiles. All of these are important categories. The word diaspora is a very important category. But I want you to think of the movement of people, right? And the movement of people is something that, again, is really at the crux of many of the debates today. As I've already suggested with my examples of the so-called wall here, the whole, whole debate on immigrants, and I gave you the example of Syria. I could give you the example of numerous other countries too. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees uh, has put forward figures suggesting that there are 70 million people who presently are not living in the country where they would want to live in, right? That they've been displaced. This does not include the millions, tens of millions of people who have suffered internal displacement, 
in various countries. China and India being two very good examples of countries where there's been forced internal displacement. Because when the Chinese, for example, decided that they were going to have this massive dam project, Three Gorges River Dam project, well, that displaced millions of people. The Narmada River Valley project in India displaced a huge number of people. So we're not even looking at those people who have been displaced internally. Right? And we're not really even looking at internal migrations. Um, one of the, uh, I can give you, ex again, this is simply an illustration. The city where I was born, Delhi, the last census before the part independence and partition of India was 1941. The population of Delhi at that time was less than half a million. Today, it is 22 million. 22 million. Massive displacement of people, migration, movement of people to these clusters, you know. The Tokyo metropolitan region has 36 million people, by the way, all right? So these are all internal migrations. So, but I want you to think about movement of people and what that signifies, okay, all right? And within that, we have a number of things that I want to look at a little bit more closely because we obviously will not be able to look at all of them. And I also want you to think about such things as what are diasporas. If you look at this, I'm going to show you a number of slides in quick succession. And yet, once again, a reminder that all of these will be posted as they have been posted before. Right? So you, <coughs> and this, this diagram is a bit old, but you'll see comparisons with more recent figures. So these are the two, two largest diasporas that we have. And when I say largest, again, I want you to, you can put that in quotation marks. Because, of course, if you speak of the African diaspora, right, if you speak of the African as a singular, as opposed to the, the, the diaspora of, of people coming from West Africa, from Ghana, for example, okay, or what used to be called the Gold Coast, or coming from Mozambique, we, you know, when they, when, when they speak about an African diaspora, they're, they're not making those kinds of distinctions. And we're not really speaking now today about people who have been moving in recent years. This, so if you look at the African diaspora, then obviously it's probably the largest. If you're looking at all the people of African origin displaced onto the Americas, both North America and, of course, South America as well. Uh, and, of course, people of African origin uh, in countries such as Britain, uh, let's say, right? But if you, if, if, and again, German diaspora, I mean, nobody ever speaks of a German diaspora, but frankly, you could if you, if you looked at all the people of German origin, okay, in the United States and in South America, right? But there was no movement of Germans Obviously, for example, post-World War II, you don't have Germans relocating to the United States. I mean, apart from a few people who came, Jewish refugees and all of that, but I'm talking about at, at the end of World War II, moving into the 50s. So if you leave out that, and the word diaspora, let me just explain to you for a moment, um, originally was always used vis-a-vis -vis only one group, but no one really holds to that view any longer. It, it was used with reference to the Jews because the whole idea was that the word diaspora really means also dispersal, that the Jews had always been dispersed. In fact, that was their identity, to be dispersed, so to speak, all right? But now if you look at India and China, two major diasporas, because you have huge numbers of Indians and Chinese scattered all around the world. Um, there are countries such as Mauritius, Trinidad, Fiji, Guyana, Trinidad, Okay, I'm giving you five countries which have huge Indian populations. I'm speaking as a percentage, because of course most of these countries are very small. Uh, Fiji is very small, uh, but uh, if you look at the total population, you find that at one point, until about 20 years ago, 53% of the population was of Indian origin. Now the numbers have gone down because many of these Indo-Fijians migrated to Australia and New Zealand because of political problems. Uh, in Fiji, including two coups, all right? 
uh, at Trinidad, again, the population is roughly divided equally between Afro-Trinidadians and Indo-Trinidadians, that is, people of Indian origin and people of black origin. Uh, all right. uh, and of course, if you go to Southeast Asia, if you go to Malaysia, you go to Singapore, uh, needless to say, you have people, uh, an immense number of people of Chinese uh, uh, origin. All right, so these are, th this is a map that shows you the two diasporas and the top 20 countries that you, where you find their populations. So if you look at the United States here, these figures are inaccurate because the Indian population is now 4 million. This, this, this map shows 2.25 million, but it's closer to 4 million now. Um, and then you see migrant population by country of origin. Um, by country of origin, which country sen has sent out most migrants? So India here. Is, has sent out more, 16.6 .6 million, according to this way of calculation. And then you have countries such as China, the Russian Federation. You notice Syrian Arab Republic, 6.9. That's the 7 million refugees that I'm talking about. These are people who have all had to flee over the course of the last few years. All right. Now, I want to look at two, th two three case studies. One, I want to look at Indian indentured labor. And then I want to look at US uh, migration to the United States and to and to the new world more generally, right? And this is not gonna be a philosophical exploration for the most part, it's gonna be more factual, but particularly with this portion, I want, you to, I want to alert you to some ways of thinking about um, uh, the various conditions under which people migrate and the various forms of servitude all often involved in such migration. So the Indian indentured labor, what is that? In the 1830s, right, to understand that, just keep in mind two things. 1808, Britain abolishes the slave trade. I had mentioned that in passing in one of my early lectures to you. And then in 1835, you have the abolition of slavery in British possessions. It did not end slavery in countries such as Brazil, but in British possessions, you have the end of slavery officially in 1835. Now, to make a long story short, this posed a problem for people who were plantation owners in countries such as Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad. You had sugar plantations because once you have the abolition of slavery, you need a labor force. The labor force used to be the slaves, of course, black slaves, and as I said, I'm really cutting short the story. <laughs> okay, there's a long, complicated discussions about exactly what transpired, but the, main, the gist of it is that labor costs are gonna to become too expensive because free black men and women are no longer willing to labor except at a price that they set. Which is again, not entirely true because they were not always in the position of being able to set a price. But nonetheless, the, the notion was that you need a labor force. Now, where are you going to get this labor force from? All of these are British colonies that I'm looking at, just for the moment, well, the three countries that I mentioned to you. Right? And, of course, India is a British colony. And there's various sets of negotiations, the consequence of which is that Indians are still going to start going to the Caribbean, beginning, beginning with Trinidad. Second half of the 1830s, 1836 approximately, 1835, 1836, and then to other, other parts of the Caribbean, right? And then eventually, for example, 1880s to Fiji, which is another place where there was sugar plantations, all right? And you also are going to have Indian indentured laborers, as they're called, I'll explain to you what that term means, going to places such as Mauritius, 1840s, and Malaysia, again, in the second half of the 1800s. Now, these people, and you have a reading there called from a passage of uh, uh, 20, 30 pages from this extraordinary book called Coolitude. These people were called coolies. Coolie is a pejorative term. Uh, the equivalent would be the N word for black people, more or less. All right? But, but the word coolie is a pejorative word, but it also meant a laborer, someone who does hard labor, someone who physically carries things as well. All right? And so what, the, what these authors are doing in the, in the reading that was assigned to you from Coolitude is they're trying to evoke the world of this person. Uh, now, they're called indentured laborers officially because they are indentured, just like 
just like Englishmen who came to the, who came to the 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard, yeah, as indentured servants. Many people aren't aware of the fact that there were lots of people who came here as indentured servants. So these were people who came, white people who came in the 1700s, for example, and they would come with their master and they basically agreed to serve as the master's butler or cook or servant or whatever the case might be, right? And you usually sign a five-year contract. Uh, the, the terms of the contract might vary a bit, but it would usually a five-year contract. Your passage would be paid. You would be, given, you would be given food and shelter wherever you went, and you had to really work for those five years. Uh, often the working conditions were quite difficult. Uh, one very prominent scholar of an older generation by the name of Hugh Tinker wrote a book on this, and he called it a new form of slavery. And again, that's a very complicated set of discussions, whether one should call it that or not. But the point is that they, they worked under very difficult conditions. Uh, and there was an overseer. There are cases of sexual exploitation. Uh, these cases go to court, so we know about many of these cases. Right? So th this is this force, that, labor force that I'm talking about. Over a million Indians went. Many of them did not go voluntarily. Many of them had no idea at all where they were going. The vast majority of them were illiterate. Some of them thought they were going from the inland to Calcutta and they would find work there. They were put on a ship there and the next thing you know, they are on the ship for three months and then they arrive at a place called Trinidad or Fiji. Right? That's, those are the conditions that we're really talking about. But this was certainly not free labor. That's what I'm su suggesting to you. It's a form of unfree labor. And the British tried to regulate it because, again, for a large number of reasons, partially it had to do with conditions of sanitation and hygiene, particularly on the boat, if it's a passage of two, three months. Um, now, this is not quite like the Middle Passage. I, that, you have to be very clear. We're not talking here about, you know, one-fourth one, uh, uh, one of the entire a population of the ship just dying um, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on route to, uh, to their destination. We're not talking about people who were, who were shackled, as was the case with slaves during the Middle Passage. Right? If you've ever seen photographs of these, or not photographs, sketches of these and paintings of these, of these uh, boats that brought over um, uh, people from Africa to, uh, to the Americas. Right? But uh, again, in some cases, these boats were modified, and, and when the indentured laborers came, very often they moved into what had been the, 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 uh, the quarters, the living quarters of the slaves be before them, all right? Um, the British tried to, tried to ensure some degree of conformity to some notions of what you might call you know, safe passage, uh, ensure that there was not too much exploitation, that there was some degree of food and water available, and that's what I mean by the conditions of departure um, and the passage, uh, and of course when they arrived, uh, they were then taken to wh whichever plantation they would be working at. Um, uh, and of course, if you're thinking about why is it that these countries have such a large Indian population, the reason quite obviously now is that many of these people, once they've finished their term of contract of five years, sometimes they, re sometimes they sign themselves up to, for another contract, but many of them eventually stayed on and eventually became the dominant ethnic group in some of these countries, such as Fiji and Mauritius and Trinidad and so on. Right? And there was a person called the protector of emigrants. Uh, the working conditions of the plantation, there's a great amount of detail there, but it really is working as, a, as was the case with slaves, working from um, um, uh, sunrise to sundown uh, very often, uh, and usually at least six uh, uh, days a week uh, so we are talking about 12-hour working days. Uh, an overseer who was quite liberal in his use of the whip uh, to try to bring these people into order. Um, and as I've said, especially when the number of women increases, as is always the case. I mean, I'm going to make a general observation. But with all of these, whether it's indentured immigration, whether it's actually just immigrants coming into the, coming into the Americas, coming, in, coming to the United States, there is a disproportionate number of men in the early years. It takes a long time. You know, eventually one of the things they had to pass was they had to pass a rule and say that for every, for every four men, there had to be one woman. 
um, uh, and, and, and one of the reasons, it, it did not that this happened initially. Initially, it was really lopsided. 90% of the people who were coming were men, minimum 90%. Some ships, it was 95%. But, but then they had to increase the number of women because, of course, they found that when these people arrived there, then there were problems because you have a hugely disproportionate number of men, and what do you do about satisfying their sexual thirst, for example? Right? It's questions like that, which really, which really come up. And, and of course, the notion was that if you bring in women, they're going to domesticate the men. They're going to put them in order, as it were. Just, there's going to be less hooliganism you know, and less rowdiness if you have women. Because, of course, this was the old idea, women as constituting a kind of a civilizing, domesticating, nurturing force. Right? Uh, and so eventually they passed legislation that for every four men on a boat, there had to be one woman. Then it was changed to three to one. The ratio was changed eventually over a period of time. All right? But we also have to think about what happens in those societies where they arrive, because you have a black population already there, right? which is now a free population in principle. I, I say in principle for the same reason that that you have to think about the black people as not being free, for the most part, even after the Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, if you just have to look at the body of work and see what happened, right? What were the conditions under, under which these people worked and, and the regimes of terror that were inflicted on black people moving all the way, of course, into the 1900s. And one cannot understand the history of the Deep South without that, obviously, right? But the question here is, there are news kinds of biracial and multiracial societies that are being created, right? And this creates, leads to all kinds of interesting complications and problems uh, as well. It leads to interesting possibilities as well. We should not simply think this, of this as a problem. It leads to new forms of art. So if you look at Trinidad, I mean, the Caribbean, for my money, has been the richest contributor to world culture in the last 40 years, when I just think of the number of great writers that have come out of the Caribbean, right? The kind of music, Calypso. I don't know how many of you have ever heard Calypso music, all right? Or when you think of the great dub poets like Linton Crazy Johnson from Living in London. I mean, this is only possible in these creolized slash biracial, multiracial societies from which they came out, all right? So it wasn't simply a set of problems, which is how usually historians think of it, uh, particularly political scientists. That's all political scientists do, frankly. They just, you know, how many people are there of African origin? How many of Indian origin? And you know, who gets what kind of vote and what kind of vote banks they have and so forth and so on? But that, that's not going to tell you much about what kind of societies were being created, really. And the new forms of culture, art, music, cuisine that emerged from these societies, right? But so we'd have to think about that. Um, and I don't have the luxury, unfortunately, uh, for obvious reasons of being able to get, enter, into, uh, in, enter into all of these details. But you did have, if you're looking at the politics, you did have a sharp racial divide. And the history of Trinidad and Guyana, two societies where you have roughly equal number of black people and Indian people, right? Has, is a history of this divide, which is reflected in the political parties. It is reflected on who gets what kind of patronage, depending on which party is in power. And of course, we have to remember that in some ways, that all of these people, if you had to take the long view of things, whether they're black people, or whether they're Indians, or whether they're whites, not too many, but there are roughly between three to 10% depending on which face you're looking at here. They're all interlopers because the indigenous people was white, population was wiped out, nearly, right? I mean, Caribbean, why is it called the Caribbean? Because the indigenous people are the Caribs. How many, what percentage of the population of Trinidad is comprised of Caribs? Just a few percentage points at best, at best. So in a sense, everyone who came there was an interloper, a newcomer to that society. And that, again, is partly the tragedy, because 
It's the priority of our arrival. Well, I came before you did, so therefore now I have rights to this land. This is a way of thinking. You know. And of course, what I'm saying there is true of the United States, needless to say. Right? This notion that somehow white people have precedence because they came here first uh, is something that uh, is based on what I would call a primitive form of reasoning, frankly. You know. All right? But these are the divides that you've had. In Fiji, it was a little bit different because the real divide was between the ethnic Fijians. You didn't have a black population. You had ethnic Fijians, and then you had Indo-Fijians. You know, all right? And uh, this map here shows you uh, where they're coming from, the indentured laborers who, who went from India in the beginning in the 1830s all the way until the early part of the 1900s. It wasn't, by the way, until the second decade of the 20th century, 1917 to be exact, that the system of Indian indentured migration was officially abolished. It was as late as that, right? It had really dwindled. The numbers had dwindled already by the early 1900s, early, early 1900s, they dwindled, but it wasn't officially abolished until 1917. So they're coming mainly from the Hindi-speaking belt. Uh, that's the dominant language in North India, and then they're coming here from South India, from, um, um, you know, there would be largely what I call Tamil speakers over here. And I want you to look at this, because this is a picture about the problems of modern systems of counting. All right, I want to dwell on this for a moment. What is this? These are Indian indentured immigrants. They come to the port, they arrive. Each of them is given a number. You become a number. You're just a statistic. You're just a statistic. You're, you're, you don't have a name, you don't have a personality. Now we're, this is also a part of modern. If you think being a part of modern is being enlightened and having rights and all that, this also is a characteristic feature of modernity. The fact that we enter into an age when we just become statistics. All right? A certain kind of anonymity, the extinction of personality, Regimes of counting. You see, when you enter into the modern age, you enter into the age of being counted. And when you get counted and classified and categorized, then you also start to have a singular personality, if I may put it this way. That is, and now you have to declare who you are, whether you're male or female, whether you're black, white, Chinese, Japanese, whether you're Hindu, Muslim, Christian. What if you thought you were all Hindu and Muslim and Christian? And we're going to see that, that there are countries such as India people thought that way. Why do I have to have a singular identity, so to speak? But when you start to live in the age of enumeration, so a friend of mine, a colleague of mine in, in the history department has, Ted Porter wrote a book called Trust in Numbers that we began to have a trust in numbers, so to speak, in the 19th century. And we're, that's the age we're living in. An age where everything is enumerated. It's become much worse today. Much worse today, because today almost everything is a system of metrics. Um, the chancellor of this university is coming up for, uh, you know, his, uh, his stewardship of the university is being evaluated as it is every five years. And so I read his self-statement. And half the self-statement is about metrics. This is UCLA's ranking. These are the number of students who have applied, blah, 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 right? It's all about metrics. This numbers is related to that. Don't think it's not. And this is the fate of these people. That's why I'm showing you this. And every person who came was given this number. You were just given a number here. And then you had to stand, and you know, usually, you know, when you see photographs like this, you know what, these are mugshots. And you know who you take mugshots of? Criminals. So this was also a criminalization of a population. Th this is what it means to be modern, all right? Now, 
And this is the report from the first arrival of Indians in Natal. Natal is a province of what would become South Africa. It was not South Africa then. The Union of South Africa was only formed in 1905. So this is the, the coolies here. You notice a title, the coolies here. November 22, 1860. Okay, the first article published on their arrival of Indians in Natal. Um, Natal is particularly important because 30 some odd years later, an Indian by the name of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, known to the world as Mahatma Gandhi, would arrive there too. All right? So that's the reason why I particularly picked that. All right? And here is this. Then, of course, you had a more elaborate system of, so this is 1862 now. Now this is, you're already moving, you know, from the time, 20, 25 years. Um, and this is the, the ticket that was issued when the person boarded the ship, some identification, okay? And here you have this, this I will have to omit this slide because it's too complicated. So that's a set of slides I wanted to show you about, about Indian indentured migration, all right? To, as I said, various parts of the world. Now I wanna look at the other side of this, um, another case study, and this has to do with um, migration to the Americas. And by that I mean, of course, not only, not only the United States, but I also mean uh, the new world in, in, gen in general, all right? Um, <clears throat> if you look at this, let's just take a look at these slides just so you have a little bit sense of what were the patterns of immigration. And I think for the US, I think it's particularly important because even though countries such as Australia and New Zealand and Canada, which are also predominantly white colonies, settler colonies, right? Like the United States. The difference is that they do not occupy the same space in the world imagination as the United States does. Not even remotely. Not even remotely, right? And so that's why if we are thinking about an immigrant society, the US is what we really should be looking at. Um, and of course, the population of the US is going to show a considerable increase and change over a period of decades. Between 1770, now if you look at 1770, so that's just a few years before the Declaration of Independence, right? 1770, the vast majority of the immigrants in this country would have been of English origin, followed by the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, right? Predominantly. Then you would have had some Germans, people of German origin. Between 1770 and 1830, you have relatively little migration into the United States. In fact, you have a significantly more, in some respects, um, to Canada, um, which included people who were loyalists, and you know, once the US uh, becomes an independent country, people who were of different political dispensation moved to Canada. Um, after 1830, the migration is going to pick up. Large-scale migration is gonna pick up. Again, at this point, largely from Britain, Ireland, Germany, and then you also have people coming from Central Europe and coming from Scandinavia, attracted by what? Cheap farmland. That's the major attraction. Some are artisans, some are factory workers. And, and here when I say factory workers, now I'm not speaking about 1830s because there are no factories at that point, but I'm speaking now here about moving into the 1860s and, and 1870s. And then if you move into the 1880s, 1890s, some of them are coming as longshoremen, as lumber, particularly if you look at the West Coast, if you look at Oregon, Washington, places like that, what you're really speaking about is people coming to work in places such as the lumber industry. Now, we have already seen, if you recall my comments from my previous lecture, that there was a treaty that was signed, Treaty of Berlingen, 1868, uh, which brings Chinese laborers, and these are people to the United States, and these are people who are gonna start to work on the railroads, right? Um, we're not obviously looking at all the possible implications 
that arise from there. But I want to look at one passage of a book, and then I want to turn to these slides. We have about five, uh, ten, uh, seven minutes remaining. So this is a reading from Mary Anton, which you had, uh, a, a woman who uh, uh, lived from 1881 to 1949, uh, grew up in a Jewish family uh, in Russia, uh, and then in moved to the U.S. with her father in 1891, the promised land, right? You remember that reading that we had. This is the one passage I want to look at. So she says that one of the things that impressed her the most is the following, quote, education was free. Now, where is she coming from? She's coming from Tsarist Russia, okay? Don't forget that. She's coming from Tsarist Russia. She could have made the same observation anywhere. I mean, that is that no matter where she had come from, if she had come to the U.S., she would have said, hey, I'm really dazzled by the fact that education is free. Right? But it has more meaning because she's coming from Tsarist Russia because Tsarist Russia was a regime of surveillance. Right? They, they kept a watch on you. Right? Now she comes here. She says education was free. That subject my father had written about repeatedly as comprising his chief hope for us children. Right? That her father is saying that this is what's really most impressive and this is why I have some hope in this new land because education is free. Right? The essence of American opportunity. And we should not understate the significance of this. This is important. The treasure that no thief could touch. I like that. The treasure that, no, you, this is not something you can take away. You cannot strip a person. Right? And that's why, of course, by the way, to, to put this in a different register, some of the most extraordinary writing in the world over the last 2,500 years has come from people who were sent to jail. Because you can strip a man or a woman, literally strip them naked and jail, torture them, try to deprive them of their dignity, but if they have a mind, you cannot take that away from them, right? And th there is an enormous literature that has come out from people who were imprisoned, you know. Henry David Thoreau, in, in our period, writes an essay. Well, of course, he goes to jail only for one day, unlike many others who spent, you know, years and years in jail, right? And then, of course, Mohandas Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, you know, the list goes on and on. And people who wrote, and Jawaharlal Nehru's glimpse, right, who wrote from jail. Right? But why is this significant? It was the one thing. Let me, let me read it out now without interrupting. And then we pause to consider it. That subject, education was free. That subject my father had written about repeatedly as comprising his chief hope for us children, the essence of American opportunity, the treasure that no thief could touch, not even misfortune or poverty. It was the one thing that he was able to promise us when he sent for us, surer, safer than bread or shelter. Okay, now I want to pause and consider what's, going, what's happening here. You see, when we think of the middle class, because she is part of a group of people who are going to become the middle class. And one of the things that made the middle class what it was in countries such as the United States, Britain, France, Germany, was the rise of a middle class that was able to avail of certain kinds of things that were held in common. This is a notion of what is common, social goods that are in common. And those included such things as education, free education, a free public library system. It's a pity no one uses it anymore. I, you go to the Westwood Public Library, it's beautiful. There's hardly anybody there because everybody's, of course, on their little gadget, right? It took enormous effort to put together these systems. A system of public lighting, that's part of the lecture under technology, right? Street lighting. Now, we have to understand the notion of social goods because this was one of the contributions of the middle class to the United States as it was in Western Europe. 
which is there's this idea that you don't have to personally necessarily benefit from it, but you must contribute to it. I, for example, will continue to pay taxes if I'm living in my neighborhood, as I am in, in LA County, when I get my property tax bill, you know, if you've never taken a look at your, your parents' property tax bill, do so. When you, when you look at the property tax bill, it gives you a breakdown. It tells you what percentage of that money is going to the local community college and the school, the public school. Now, if all the people who were paying that said, hey, we're not going to pay it if we don't have children. Okay, the ones who have children will most likely say that's fine. Although, of course, in this country, given the, the, the vigorous reaction to taxation, the fact that some people just simply find the idea of taxation revolting, they object even to that. But let's just be reasonable about it and say that most people with children will have no objection. But let's say people who have no children at all say, hey, why should I be paying $500 out of my property tax bill every year for public education? I don't have any children. And that is precisely the idea of social goods. That if you are part of a society, you contribute to it, even if you personally have nothing to gain, so to speak. Okay? And this was what struck her. Education is free. Okay? Well, we'll have to continue with this in the next lecture. Um, and just keep up with the reading because we will eventually catch up, I can assure you.